Thanks. Thanks for the introduction and thanks for inviting me. Um, yeah, okay, so here's the issue for today that I want to talk about. What kind of relationship is there between being an externalist of a certain kind, and I'll explain that in a moment, and believing in the existence of representations in a robust sense? Okay, so that's the issue. And the way you can set this up as something that's worth thinking about is to start from what I think uncontroversially, at least as a description of the practice, uh, we can see as two commitments of orthodox cognitive science, okay, mm -hmm. most cognitive science as performed. The first is what philosophers now sometimes call vehicle internalism. Um, I'll just refer to it as internalism. There are lots of different kinds of internalism. Those who've got a recent background in, in philosophy of mind will know there's another thesis content internalism. I'm not interested in that today. Um, we're just interested in vehicle internalism, which I'll call internalism. And this is the claim that the material realizers of cognitive states and processes are always located entirely inside the skin. So we have this idea that cognitive states and processes are realised in the material world, and when we try and find the bit of the material world that realise those states and processes, we end up looking inside the skin, and paradigmatically, of course, in the brain. We've all seen the fMRI pictures. Um, and secondly, a commitment to what I'm going to call representationalism. Now, I want to really be as kind of hands-off about this notion as I possibly can for today. I'm not assuming a particular theory of representation. It could be predictive processing in form, it could be connectionist in form, it could be language of thought. All these are live options, right? I want to just think that there's a claim, a generic claim that's driven a lot of cognitive science, that um, intelligent thought and action, maybe not stimulus response kind of issues, but behaviour, but intelligent thought and action anyway, are ordinarily at least to be explained <coughs> in terms of the building and manipulation of content bearing structures, structures to which we attribute content. Okay, I don't really want to say you know, any more about that anyway, because that's all we're going to need for today. Okay, so then there's this hypothesis uh, that many of you will be familiar with, because you'll be uh, mostly, anyway. Uh, Perhaps all of you. This is a theory that uh, Andy uh, and Dave Chalmers, perhaps, are the, uh, uh, the sort of leading uh, advocates of, uh, though Dave perhaps not so, <laughs> gone on to other things, uh, but Andy certainly over the years, of course, has introduced and defended this hypothesis in many ways. Um, and this is the hypothesis of extended cognition. Uh, some people get very excited about the distinction between cognition and mind. I don't. I'm just going to use these terms interchangeably. Again, I think that's what cognitive scientists tend to do. So according to the hypothesis of extended cognition, vehicle internalism is false. Okay? The material realisers of cognitive states and processes are sometimes located partly outside the skin. Right, so it's very important that on this understanding of extended cognition anyway, and there are others, but on this understanding of extended cognition anyway, it's entirely possible for there to be wholly internal cognitive states and processes. But sometimes cognitive states and processes extend beyond the skin in the very specific sense that the material realises that those states and processes are spread out over brain, body and world. Okay, and we can call this, as many people do, perhaps I think possibly following Susan Hurley originally, vehicle externalism, and I'll just call this externalism. And here's a much more precise kind of statement of extended cognition. This is a statement that I prefer, that I've used over the years of minor, minor alterations. I don't think it's controversial. Um, we'll see. So if the hypothesis of extended cognition is, well, it's controversial whether it's true, but I don't think it's a controversial formulation of the view, if extended cognition is true, there are actual, in this world, it's not just about sci-fi, actual in this world cases of intelligent thought and action in which the thinking and thoughts concerned, by which I mean the material vehicles that realise the thinking and thoughts concerned, are spatially distributed over brain, body and world in such a way that the external beyond the skin factors concern a rightly accorded cognitive status. And that last phrase, cognitive status, is uh, in neon lights, a kind of weasel phrase. Right? All I want it to do for the moment is be a placeholder for the following thought. Whatever status it normally is that we attribute to neural states and processes in cognitive science, we're now going to attribute that status to certain external structures. No more than that at the moment. More will be said about that. Now, um, it seems pretty clear to me um, that the possibility of extended cognition, the possibility of extended cognition, not its actual fact, but the possibility of extended cognition is entailed by what I think is the house philosophy of mind in cognitive science, i.e. functionalism. Um, if you think that what uh, 
uh, identifies a particular state or process um, as the cognitive state or process that it is, is roughly the causal role that it plays in a kind of economy, a system of, of other so-identified states and processes, um, then you're going to be open to the thought that, at least in principle, cognitive states and processes could be realised beyond the skin because there's nothing... Yeah, there are some special things about neural stuff. It's one of the things that can realise cognitive states and processes. But on this view, um, if we identify things in this functionalist way, then in principle, at least, it's not the only way. Right? Uh, the constitution it doesn't determine the, the, the cognitive status. Of course, there may well be states and processes. Uh, um, cognitive states and processes. Oh, sorry, put the other way around. There may well be some material systems, maybe beer cans and pulleys, that at least in this world can't realise cognitive yeah, states and processes. But um, we can talk about those kind of issues um, in, in the way to work out functionalism. Now, I put a little, uh, in brackets here, the word empirical functionalism. Um, here I'm just noting the fact that there are more than one type of functionalism. There's a kind of folk psychologically driven functionalism, where what you're interested in doing is giving a functionalist definition um, of type identified cognitive states and processes. Um, not going anywhere near that theory today. This is purely the kind of functionalism you see in places like cognitive psychology, um, where we're talking about the, the various functions that um, we can see states playing in, in producing intelligent thought and action. Actually, interestingly, this is one issue that separates Andy and myself on the extended mind. Andy's much keener on using a kind of folk psychological functionalism to do the work that I would use a, a scientifically uh, driven functionalism to do, but that's a, another debate. And we all know one of the reasons here, we go back to philosophy of mind introductory classes, why is it we want to be functionalists? Because we want this guy to have cognitive states and processes, and he's not made of the same stuff as this guy. Okay. So it's a kind of a, a way of delivering multiple realisability. Why does the extended cognition theorists want multiple realisability? Well, because there are arguments in the extended cognition literature, like the famous parity principle stuff that, that Andy's famous for developing, that depend on that, depend on that notion, but actually we can see it in a much more kind of intuitive way. So I think for a lot of extended cognition theorists, the following is true, it's certainly true for me. On Monday I might do a mathematical sum in my head, on Wednesday I might do it by moving stuff around on a piece of paper, simple on a piece of paper. If you can make sense of the idea there's a type identified process there that's done in two different ways, one wholly internal, one extended, then you want the idea of multiple realisability, right? Because you've got one wholly neural, neurally realised process and another process that's type identical but is spread out over a system that's partly neural, partly muscular, partly bony, partly simple on a page. Okay. Now, according to a pure form of this view of functionalism, and this is kind of just making sense of this idea of the possibility of extended cognition, i.e. a form of functionalism that doesn't assume internalism. Now, we're all used to the idea of functionalism being developed in the following way. You know, functional, the functionally identified state of pain is the state that ensues due to damage to the skin, uh, and then it causes other kind of internal states like anxiety and results in movements of the body of the kind that, you know, involve bringing the doctor. But, of course, there's nothing written into the letter of functionalism that requires internalism. Um, as we've already said, functionalism just requires a system within which we can see certain states and processes performing certain functions. And in principle, therefore, the functionalist doesn't have any reason to think that the system of interest here, the cognitive system, couldn't be one that's spread beyond the, beyond the skull and skin. OK, so that's why there's a kind of, in principle, uh, uh, argument towards extended cognition that comes from functionalism. It won't do the whole work because, of course, there could be many functions that are performed by systems that aren't cognitive functions. So in addition to saying that we want functionalism, it has to be a sense of giving a sense of what the cognitive functions here are. For that, I think, again, an issue that sometimes divides Andy himself, um, I think we need something like a notion of a mark of the cognitive, and I'll say more about that a little bit later. So call this position extended functionalism, it's with the differences that I've already noted, it's a position that's shared by Andy um, and, and myself. Alright, so, at this point you might say um, that functionalism, and it obviously there are going to be people in this room who won't like these kind of conceptual historical links because they've quite rightly pointed out various issues with them, but functionalism enjoys a number of conceptual and historical links with computationalism. Um, the, which I take here to be the view that cognitive processes are a subset of computational processes. For example, you've got Putnam's classic presentation of functionalism using a Turing machine as an illustrative example. 
And you've got the idea that computationalism is a key assumption in much of cognitive psychology, and as I said, you know, functionalism is a way of making sense of this idea that functionalism is, a, is the kind of house philosophy of mind in cognitive psychology. If computationalism is a form of functionalism, which I know some people disagree with, but if computation is a form of functionalism, then you can see how that all fits together. Now, if you are committed to the following thought, which again isn't, isn't unassailable, but many people would take to be uh, defensible at least, that there's no computation without representation, sorry, then you can see why this picture <coughs> means that functionalists standardly maintain a commitment to some variety of representationalism. In fact, in a paper that I'll talk more about in a moment, um, Eric and uh, Michael Kirchhoff and Dan Hutto um, argue that, in fact, um, functionalism needs representation in order to have any kind of sense of marking out what the cognitive functions are. I don't need anything as strong as that for today. Let's just say that there are some natural links between computationalism and functionalism. And if computation uh, requires representation, then there'll be some natural links between functionalism and uh, representationalism. And of course, extended functionalists are no different to any other kind of functionalists in this respect, although of course, the representational palette, as you might say, is now expanded to encompass both internal and external representations. So some of the representations that play a role in a genuinely cognitive process might include letters in notebooks, uh, mathematical symbols on pages, so on and so forth. External representations. More on this soon. So, no problem there. Okay, we've seen, we've seen a move here, right? We've seen the rejection of vehicle internalism in favour of vehicle externalism, so in favour of the extended cognition view, but we've, we've already made sense of the idea that extended cognition theorists, <coughs> played out in a functionalist register, retain a commitment to um, representationalism. So it looks like we've got a nice way of understanding what's going on here. Um, there's a move in contemporary cognitive science, or philosophy of cognitive science, that rejects the vehicle internalist bit, but keeps the representation bit of the standard picture. But not so fast, okay? because there are voices in the literature, um, and uh, one of those voices, of course, coming on next, um, Eric Mean, along with Dan Hutto and Michael Kirchhoff, um, in texts like, well, Hutto and Mean in Radical, Radical <coughs> and Activism, along with Kirchhoff in a recent paper, Extensive and Activism, and as well as Tony Shimero in his book, Radical Embodied Cognitive Science, where on one way of understanding what these, these authors are arguing, I think explicitly in Shimero and implicitly in, in, <coughs> in Hutto and me, and I'll say more about that in a moment, there's an argument um, that upsets, as it were, this, this neat move where we accept vehicle externalism but keep hold of representations. Some critics of representationalism in general, okay, these are people who don't like the whole idea of content-bearing states in terms of in understanding internal architectures uh, uh, at all, in terms of standard cognitive science, so they're going to argue against the notion of content altogether, playing that kind of role in cognitive science. They also think, I think, that um, this continued adherence to some kind of commitment to content on the part of the extended cognition theorist leaves the extended cognition theorist in a kind of vulnerable position with respect to their internalist critics. So the thought here is that um, the extended cognition theorist has made a strategic mistake. To deliver vehicle externalism, what the extended cognition theorist needs to do is to give up on the representationalist bit as well. Where representations here just means commitment to content-bearing structures, and thus a commitment to content. So the arguments are going to go like this, um, and I'll try and deal with all of this, hopefully, in the time I've got. Okay, good, I've got that. Uh, they argue first that representationalism entails, or at least favours or invites internalism. This is explicit in Shimero, and I think implicit in Hutto and Mean, and I'll say more about that in a moment. And explicitly in both camps, the idea that if you go anti-representationalist, then that will entail, or at least favour or invite externalism. Okay, so we've got two directions of reasoning, obviously they slot together neatly, that um, if you end up committing yourself to representations, to content, you'll end up not being able to defend externalism against internalism. And on the other hand, if you give up on content, you give up on representationalism as I'm defining it, then you'll be able to see a, a clear route to externalism. All right, so the externalist ought to be anti-representationalist. And I'm just going to take anti-representationalism here to be the following thought. At least the basic forms of intelligent thought and action are not to be explained in terms of the building and manipulation of content-bearing structures. This notion of a basic form of intelligent thought and action, I think, is tricky. 
I'm here on a lean to a certain extent on what Dan and Eric say, which is that there are, there are forms of cognition, clearly cognition, that involve things like, an example I'll talk about later, um, things like phonotactic behaviour in, in, in crickets, but also things like manual, skilled manual activity on the part of human beings, that we want to count as, purely, as, as, as genuinely cognitive, but which um, we should make sense of in anti-representational terms. That's completely open to a thought that later on in the story will involve content in some way, representation in some way, but the standard thought on the table here is usually from, from these critics of representation that this will come by way of our kind of engagement with external structures that genuinely do uh, carry content. There's a kind of scaffolding story about higher level cognition that will involve engagement with content bearing external structures. But for the, at least the basic form, I have to say here that the, the, one of the sort of radical and activist kind of stories is just how far we can go with the anti-representationist part of the programme. Um, so how much of cognition will really in the end fall to being anti-representationist. All right, so here's a really important point. Um, I've characterised the radical and activist as, um, as a vehicle externalist. So I see this as a battle over the right kind of externalism, representationalist or not. I have absolutely no doubt, Eric's a much more kind of laid-back kind of guy, that if Dan was in the room, he'd be up on a chair by now. <laughs> because he just really dislikes the notion of a vehicle. The whole vehicle notion for Dan is, uh, is you know, work of the devil. <laughs> but why? But why? Well, it's because I think the radical and activist, and, and I think it's very much true in Dan's general philosophical work, holds that vehicle talk assumes representationism, right? You ask, what are the vehicles carrying? Well, they're carrying content, right? So this kind of link between vehicles and content. And thus, as if that were true, then of course, uh, Hutter and me would be quite right to say that the fate of vehicles depends on the fate of content. And given that they're anti-content, anti-representationalist, that would mean they'd have to be anti-vehicle, which means they particularly can't be vehicle externalists, right? That would be the, the argument. I think this is just a really um, narrow and indefensible notion of a vehicle. Okay, so I'm here just going to follow Susan Hurley, and my general assumption in, in philosophy is that Susan is right okay, <laughs> <laughs> about everything. Um, yeah, you know. um, so I'm just going to follow Susan here quite, I think, uh, and I think this is the right way to think about these things, that the notion of vehicle makes no assumption that the materially realised states um, cognitive states and process story type over there um, are representationist in form. We could have all kinds of you know, self-organising dynamics that are described in terms of attractors in some kind of space, and that's we could understand all that as being realised in a particular physical material system. And that might be a non-representational story. So the idea here is that the notion of a vehicle or a realiser, I'm taking those terms to be equivalent, the notion of a vehicle or a realiser doesn't force you to be uh, representationist. So when I use the term vehicle, I'm using it in this much more general sense, and that means that um, I think the radical and activists who think of cognition as constituted by various forms of wide-reaching sensory motor interaction, that's roughly their notion of embodied cognition, um, they will end up being externalists. They don't think cognition is located within the skull, um, it spreads out into the world, that makes them vehicle externalists on this view. I've already said that. Okay. So radical activism is a form of vehicle externalism. So the battle now is which form of vehicle externalism is right? Is it the extended mind theory with its commitment to functionalism and representations? Or is it the radical and activist and Tony Chimero's radical embodied cognitive science that is committed to a non-representational story? All right, so here's an argument, right? Very general form. Nobody states it explicitly like this, but here's a kind of argument that you see, I think, in the anti-representationist literature of this kind. Right, so extended functionalism is sadly developed in a representationalist register, but representationalism, in some way that I've got to specify, invites internalism. And that's why the extended functionalist will be unable to repel the most powerful of the internalist counter arguments to which it's subjected. So there's a kind of way of trying to nudge the externalist, the vehicle externalist, into being an anti-representationist. The thought is if you maintain your commitment to representationalism, there's something about the commitment to representations, to content, that will lead you to be an internalist. Right. Now, that, as it's stated, that shouldn't compel anybody, right? But we'll have to say more about why that's true. And here's the story, right? So you all know the story about vampires. This is the picture, right? You know, if you invite the vampire into your house, then the vampire can bite you. 
right? Mm -hmm. It's the same story, right? If you invite the representations into your theory, they come back to bite you, uh, and you can't really serve this anymore. <laughs> <coughs> ah, and that's so. This is the this is. I mean, this is. We've already agreed. This is this is kind of true. So it's this premise that needs needs uh, defence. So here's Tony Schiavo's argument, which I think is clearly explicitly there, but at the same time, I think easily resisted. So Tony argues in Radical Cognitive Cognitive Science. He says um, the wide computationalist, which here is just the extended functionalist, <coughs> for all intents and purposes. The extended functionalist explanation ascribes representations of the environment to the agent. Explaining the agent's activity in terms of its representations invites the anti-extended claim that it's the represented environment and not the environment itself that is part of the cognitive system. So note the way Tony's argument goes here. He's going to say, look, the extended functionalist agrees that there are internal and external representations. But as soon as the extended functionist allows that there are internal representations, they will be representations of the environment in some way beyond the system. And that means that we no longer have to count anything external to the, to the scheme here as, as cognitive in status. They're just the things represented by the inner representations. So the thought here would be that whatever it is in that, think about the extended functionist picture. There's the skin, then there's the, ba that's the barrier of the, if you like, the organic system. Then there's these, this system that's spread out into the world, and that has a boundary too, right? There's the world beyond that. I take it that what Shemira's argument is supposed to do is say this. If there are internal representations inside the skin that represent bits of the environment that are still within the confines of the represented system, representing system, sorry, then they will can rule those out as being cognitive. But they're precisely the things the extended functionist wants to count as cognitive, right? To get the extent of the vehicle externalist answer. I think the response to this is quick and easy. It's a style of response that we, we've used a lot in the extended cognition literature. I mean, just imagine a wholly internalist story, right? It's, it's completely clear in the internalist cognitive science that we often think about bits of the cognitive system representing other bits of the internal cognitive system. Metacognition trades in that description all the time. But the very fact that those other bits of the internal cognitive system are represented by some other bit. It doesn't stop us counting them as cognitive. Right? No reason to think that at all. So just in terms of fair treatment principles, that on its own cannot be sufficient for ruling out the bits of the environment that are represented in this story, the relevant bits, um, for <coughs> counting as cognitive. So I think that response just, um, just doesn't, get, doesn't get going. All right, so here's, the, here's another kind of invitation to internalism. And this is the bit where I have to do a little bit of textual exegesis of, uh, of, of Hutter and Min, um, and, or at least Hutter Min and Kirchhoff sometimes, um, and to see why there's this argument going on. So here's the idea. Explicitly in the text, the radical activists claim that debates over extended cognition typically end in a stalemate, with the internist and the externist not being able to, to shift them from their favoured views. And they explicitly state that the existence of that stalemate is to be explained by the shared commitment to representationalism. Because the way for the radical and activist to get over the stalemate and get to a genuinely externalist picture is to ditch the notion of content. Otherwise we end up in stalemate. So officially the radical and activist line is that this deadlock will be broken only by non-representationalism. More on that later. But what's interesting is that the radical and activist's own analysis Right? suggests that the deadlock is actually broken by the claim that representationalism invites internalism. And then the rejection of representationalism is what defeats internalism. So that's a two-stage process in which the deadlock is already broken in favour of internalism, given the resources that the extended functionalist has to, has to appeal to. And it's then the extra resource of anti-representationalism that the radical activist has available that, that forces the internalist uh, to, to run with their tail between their legs. All right, so I'm going to argue that actually the deadlock is broken in the other direction, okay, in favour of the extended functionalists. And that will entail that representation, representationalism doesn't in, uh, invite internalism. All right, here's a bit of text. The <coughs> standard and strongest, this is from Hato Kirchhoff and Mir, the standard and strongest move internalists can make to motivate their position. Right, just pause there for a moment. This isn't the standard and strongest move that the internalists think they have available. This is the standard and strongest move available. That's what the text says. So the standard and strongest move internalists can make to motivate their position is to appeal to a notion of narrow or intrinsic content. 
The appeal to mental content features crucially in internalist arguments because it's needed to provide a principled mark of the cognitive, one which backs up and gives definition to demarcation claims about what's constitutive of, as opposed to merely causally supportive of, cognition. Right, that's a quote. Note here, we already get the idea <coughs> that um, the appeal to mental to intrinsic <coughs> content, which I'll talk about in a moment, is what's needed to provide a mark of the cognitive on the internalist picture. Um, and so the idea is you give up that mark of the, of the cognitive and you can get a route to externalism. But, but what about this in relation to extended functionalism? Let's be very clear. The claim here cannot be that intrinsic content, whatever it is, I'm going to come to that in a moment, cannot be that intrinsic content is just necessary for internalism, which it may be. Right? It may be. This claim doesn't say just that. Right? Because saying that intrinsic content is necessary for internalism does not entail that it's the standard and strongest move. Well, it might be the standard, but it can't be the strongest move that internalists can have available. Because it may be that appealing to a notion of intrinsic content is just as necessary right, to the externalist. So appealing to something as necessary won't cause an imbalance between the internalist and the externalist such that an appeal to it could be the strongest move internalists can make. So it has to say more than mere necessity. Now it's going to fall short of sufficiency, but it's going to be something that kind of nudges or invites or favours an internalist perspective. So the claim must be that a commitment to intrinsic content, <coughs> equivalently of my usage intrinsic representation, invites internalism. And there are other passages in Hutter and Mean that have the same, the same feel. All right, quick, three quick building blocks, right? Intrinsic content, what does that mean? Sounds spooky, right? But actually it's not. Um, it's un to be understood explicitly in Hutter and Mean's analysis, by the way, explicitly as, a, as what uh, Adams and Isala call non-derived content. Representations that mean what they do independently of other representational or intentional capacities. So, standard story, here's some Venn diagram or something in the environment. How does that get its content? Because there are representations inside my head that give it its content. Right, so that's got a derived content. But the representations in my head, the story goes, have their content without having to appeal to any other representational or intentional capacities. Or at least the buck has to stop somewhere. Right? It could be... Yeah, we'll see this in a moment. There could be conventional representations perhaps in there, but the buck has to stop somewhere. There has to be some non-derived content. A mark of the cognitive, won't say much about this, but it's going to be something like this. A scientifically informed account of what it is for a material element to be a proper part of a cognitive system. And the reason that it has to be independent of where any candidate element happens to be spatially located is so as not to beg the question and debate. Right, one way or the other. The idea is here, we fix on a theory of what the cognitive is that's locationally neutral, and then we fight it out over where cognition so conceived falls in the world. Could be wholly internal, could be just in the extent sort of the body, uh, but it could be in a system that spreads out into the external environment. That's the idea. And this mark of the cognitive is needed, among other things, to distinguish extended cognition from merely embedded cognition. So the embedded theorist thinks that cognition depends causally on environmental props and scaffolds, but all the genuinely cognitive stuff stays internal. It's just that that internal stuff couldn't get the job done without some nice causal support from the environment. The embedded theorist um, does not think of the environment as constitutively part of cognition, thinks of it as a causal support. The extended theorist takes the extra step, thinks of the environment, environmental factors concerned as literally part of the cognitive process. So a constitutive part. And the mark of the cognitive does that, because it will tell you which bits of the, the system are genuinely cognitive and which aren't. Right? So it can demarcate between embedded and extended cognition. OK, um, non-derived content. Here's the key claim. This is the claim that, in the end, drives this thought that to be a representationalist invites internalism. To accept non-derived representational content as an essential component of the mark of the cognitive invites internalism. Right? That's the thought. That's the thought we need. Why? Well, here's the kind of standard argument from the internalists. In the kinds of causally distributed systems beloved of extended functionalists, all the non-derived content will be found in the brain. With any external representational elements realising only derived and thus non-cognitive content. So that's the way the notion of non-derived content drives internalism. Okay? And 
You can see how it works. Non-action of non-derived content doesn't in itself make any ex you know, explicit reference to the brain. But it's the idea supposed to be that once we see non-derived content as the mark of the cognitive, then we'll end up in any system that we see, all the external bits of the system will end up only having derived content. Now at this point, you might think this is just the deadlock reimposing itself. Because you might think the extended functionalists can just go, hey, I'll have a different notion of representation then, right? Some other theory of representation. Not this, not this non-derived stuff. I actually think that's really hard. Okay, so think about it. So what the extended functions could say is that all representation is derived representation. But actually, the notion of non-derived representation as understood <coughs> by Adams and Isaiah is actually relatively undemanding. It will be satisfied by Dretzkian theories, by Fodorian asymmetric dependence. It's a really undemanding notion. There's nothing sort of spooky about it. So there's, there's nothing weird about that. On the other hand, and I think, you know, this is something that John Searle said some years ago. There does seem to be this problem that if you only have derived representation, you just end up with an infinite regress. So it looks like you need something like non-derived representation to block the regress. And the thought here is that the extended functionalist has to buy that, so it has to buy that there's some notion of non-derived representation, but then if it's right that all the non-derived representation is in the brain, we end up with an internalist story. So, to accept non-derived content as the mark of the cognitive is to uh, invite internalism, and that's what the extended functionalist is committed to doing. That's the thought. So the, the deadlock here that Hato and Mien, uh said we were locked in actually is broken, and indeed by their own reasoning, because as I said, they themselves think that the strongest argument the internalist could appeal to would be in terms of uh, intrinsic content. Of course, they don't believe in content, so they don't believe that the internist has a leg to stand on. But that's the second part of the story, right? <coughs> that's the part where you say the, the, uh, um, the externalist beats the internalist by getting away from the notion of content altogether. All right. Not so fast, I think. The extended functionalist doesn't need to deny that bearing non-derived content is sufficient for an element to achieve cognitive status. What the extended functionalist needs to deny is that it's strictly necessary. Right? So here's the thought. It may be that derived content is sufficient for cognitive status if the derived representations in question are part of a larger integrated system in which there are non-derived representations. Right? And uh, it's interesting that Adams and Isaiah themselves uh, seem to actually believe this. Uh, at least some components of cognitive states require some non-derived content. They seem to open the door to this kind of strategy. But then, without going into the, into the, into the example uh, in any great detail, then the doors reopen to externalism. Right? Um, as Andy pointed out in his Memento's Revenge paper, um, we might think of a, a, first of all, of a system, a wholly internal system, uh, where um, there's some non-derived content, but there's also some derived content. And he gives a nice sci-fi example of some Martian who stores visual memories in a kind of bitmap system, and then those bitmap systems, accepts, uh, bitmap signals, are sent to the Martian visual cortex in order to achieve me memory, right? Remembering. But you know, the thought here is that there's a kind of option opened up for mixed representationality, <coughs> and it looks like there are wholly internal cases like that. So we can also look at extended systems in exactly the same way. And by parity, that means we shouldn't rule them out from being genuinely cognitive systems. So the fact that the external components only have derived content doesn't stop them being cognitive by this way of thinking about things, um, because they will receive their content from genuinely non-derived representations. And it doesn't even matter for this form of externalism that all the non-derived representations end up being in the brain. Doesn't matter. Okay, so um, extended common systems can feature the same sort of uh, mixed representationality. Okay, so the internalists and the radical activists, I think, need a stronger claim here that's kind of indefensible. The claim that non-derived content is strictly necessary for cognitive status. Then it would be true, on this picture I've just sketched, that um, we would get internalism. But of course it begs the question against the extended functionalist because the extended functionalists can appeal to the mixed representationality. Is that a kind of deadlock situation? I don't think so, right? Um, the interesting thing here is that with the commitment in place, the deadlock I think here is the commitment to representationism in place, the deadlock is broken in favour of extended functionalism. Because the very thought that's supposed to establish the irresistible slide from representationalism to internalism, the appeal to non-derived content, provides a perfectly robust basis 
for the truth of extended cognition. The idea here is the internalist has played their strongest card and lost, right? That's the thought. So it does, the deadlock breaks in the, in the direction of the extended functionalist. And so it looks like the extended functionalist is appropriately poised to deliver externalism, which is, entails that representationalism doesn't invite internalism. Right, first half. Do the next bit, I think, in just a few minutes, and I'm running up against time. Maybe this is only a temporary victory, right? And here's the other half of the externalist story. Once one goes non-representational, there is no clear scientific rationale for, and no the clear theoretical means of thinking of cognitive activity, as something smaller or shorter than world involving extensive relational activity. Now, um, actually, let's read out another quote and then I'll just talk very briefly about them. Here's another quote from, from, uh, from the radical activists. To let go of the idea that basic cognition is necessarily contentful and representational in character is to remove a standardly assumed barrier to seeing at least this form of cognition as constitutively world involving. As a form of wide reaching activity, and there's a gloss on that, that's the radical activist gloss on that, that is at root extensive and unbounded. <coughs> Thus, extensive minds are not merely, occasionally, and in special circumstances extended. All right, so I take it the thought here, there's, a, there's an important thought that for the extensive inactivist, the radical the extensive externalist, the radical inactivist, one of the mistakes that the extended functionalist thinks is to think of cognition as kind of internal in, in the sort of standard cases and then extended now and then when we get these special functionally uh, spread out systems. <coughs> the idea is we should start from a kind of externalist perspective. But also the question is how are you allowed to do that? Right? It's all very well saying we should start from an externalist perspective, but you need justification given that internalism is the default in cognitive science. And here, I think, it's this notion of relational activity that does the work. So I'm just going to spend a few minutes just to finish off just thinking about that. So this claim that cognition is an essentially relational phenomenon is a common theme in the inactivist literature. You can see it in Tom Froese's work, in Ezekiel Paolo's work, in Evan Thompson and Mog Stapleton's work. But this kind of idea that cognition is relational. And if cognition is relational, then it can't be internal. That's the thought. Now, there's some really complex issues here that I've talked about in other places regarding inferences across explanatory levels. But I'm not going to worry about that today. What I want to do is this. Is I'm going to ask whether one could, one could appeal directly to some kind of relationality at the level of the vehicles, at the level of the machinery, that would justify this extensive view. All right? So, the example that's used um, by um, uh, Tony Shimero sometimes, and that Hutto... Uh, Kirchhoff and Mean appeal to in their, in their recent paper, Extensive and Activism, is the notion of affordances. Now, affordances are undoubtedly relational structures, right? Affordances are the kind of things, um, the, well, affordances are defined, as Gibson famously pointed out, as things that point both ways, both to organism and environment, to agent and environment. Right? The idea is that you know, something is sitable, sit honourable by me because of various capacities that I have. Right? The same thing that sits on board by me won't be sit on board by a blue whale. Right? So there's no doubt they're relational structures. Maybe a clever blue whale, who knows. Right, okay, so, um, and let's also assume for the moment that we can think of affordances in non-representational terms, which I'm just going to grant. That looks like a kind of extensive view, and it's an example that, that Hutto and co. like. Does psychological explanation in terms of affordances deliver externalism? I don't think so. Problem. And here I'm going to play this idea that the internalist gets to be the default. Right? <clears throat> Just because of how cognitive science is. So the externalist has to shift the internalist from their happy land. So such explanations in terms of affordances remain consistent with the claim that the genuinely cognitive elements of the behaviour generating process all remain internal. But not necessarily representational. That's the key point. I think we can have a non-representationalist internalism here. Right? How does it work? Well, we've seen loads of examples back in the 1990s. Right? Brooksian robotics. The world was awash with examples of systems that were affordance-sensitive systems but didn't have internal representations by any standard understanding. So it's a kind of embedded internalist account. Affordances are themselves relationally defined structures. But they're relationally defined structures to which certain inner mechanisms are attuned. That's the, the story that we got from situated robotics in the 1990s. And indeed, I think we're not compelled to think of these inner mechanisms as representational. They could be sensitive to affordances in non-representational ways. 
And indeed, one of the examples that Otto and me like to quote as a great example of basic cognition fits the bill perfectly. So, for instance, Barbara Webb's classic work in situated robotics um, on a study of cricket phonotaxis has a system in which, um, in part, uh, we have just two interneurons that are locked into the frequency of the male soul, right? So the beautiful thing about these, these, these neurons that then drive the motor behaviour of the cricket is it's not as it were that they, they kind of, they, they're responsive to all the sounds that are out there and somehow have to pick the one to be responsive to. They don't, they only fire at the exact frequency of the male soul. So they're correlated with the frequency of the male soul, but I think on any reasonable understanding they're not going to count as representations. So we get these kind of non-representational <coughs> stories about affordance sensitivity. There's no doubt that the, 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 the frequency of the song in the environment affords mate catching, right, on the part of the female, and it looks like we have this non-representational story, but there's no force here to think of the male song, as it were, as part of the cognitive mechanism. The cognitive mechanism is the neat little interneuron system that's locked into the, the frequency. So I don't think we get the target inference from extensive anti-representationism to externalism. Okay. Now, um, I've obviously uh, slightly missed time I talked, so what I'm not going to do is do the next bit. I was going to talk about Tony Chimero's work and bring that into the picture and see whether Tony Chimero's work on non-decomposability might give us a way to go forward here. But I think for time to make sure we, 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 get, some, we get some time to talk, what I'll do is I'll, I'll kind of leave it here. So I'm going to skip over a few slides here to get to the conclusions. We've had more Watt Governor. I love the Watt Governor. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so here we go, next slide. So... So here are some conclusions. And I think it was right for me today to focus on, on the Hutto and Mean stuff, given that Eric's a nice lead in the room for us, um, so he can tell me how wrong I am. So here are the conclusions, right? We've been assessing two claims. That representationism entails, or at least strongly favours or invites vehicle internalism. I think I showed that to be wrong through that careful analysis of the, of the arguments um, uh, that were presented in the text in the Hutto and Mean's work. And then there's this second claim that anti-representationism entails, or at least favours or invites vehicle externalism. And what I tried to do there was pick an example, the affordance uh, example, that was used by the radical activists themselves, and to give an account of that that conceded that affordances are relational structures, which is one of the main driving forces for the externalism, and indeed conceded that we can think of affordances, affordance sensitivity in non-representational terms, so granting these key planks to the extensivist story, and yet show that we can think of these mechanisms in a purely internalist embedded way. So it's like the anti-representationism doesn't give you externalism either. So I think, you know, obviously there's more to be said about the you know, nuances in the way this works, but if we just set up the space in which things are happening, it strikes me that the following is true. The most prominent arguments in support of these claims fall short of establishing their truth. But if that's true, then the triumph of vehicle externalism in cognitive science, which can be delivered, I think, appropriately by <coughs> extended functionalism rather than radical activism, the triumph of vehicle externalism in cognitive science doesn't require and so need not signal the demise of representationism. The idea is that representationism and vehicle externalism are perfectly happy bedfellows, and that's where I recommend you go. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. Any questions? Um, yeah, thanks. Um, so I'm fine with defending the possibility um, of extended mind on the basis of functionalism. <coughs> that seems to be what you've done. Um, <coughs> what I'm missing is um, like a clear m explanatory motivation to hold the claim that you know external structures like the blind man's cane and so on is, is, is cognitive. It's part of the cognitive process, right, so, or what, the iPhone yeah. or Arthur's notebook, and so on. So, um, right. because it seems that, and so part of the argument seems to be that these boundaries are arbitrary. You know, why stop at the brain? Why stop at the skin? Um, but I think that why is the skin, in the same sense, arbitrary as the brain? Right. So um, because yeah. you. I mean, Rob Rupert has argued that you know you need some kind of stable cognitive system, and, and the, the, the animal might provide that in a, in a way. And then you have this coupling and, and, and interaction with the environment. Yeah. Um, and Different by, by, by moving beyond that far yeah. and embeddedness. Um, you know. Yeah, no, I mean, that, that would be a completely different talk, right? So, um, so all I did today was sketch the fact that functionalism entails the possibility of extended cognition. And I said that, I thought the way in which that could be delivered would be if we came up with a mark of the cognitive, right, that in itself, of course, doesn't bias one way or the other, 
But then when we look at the empirical world, we find out that the cognitive functions so identified in that way end up being spread out of the brain body world. So I didn't give you today an argument that took you from the possibility to the truth, but I did give you the route that I think that argument would take. And of course, you no, know, I've argued for various you know, for the way of doing that in other papers, but I mean that would be another twenty five minutes of talking. Yeah. So so the talk here was not supposed I didn't take myself today, that's why I talked about extended functions being appropriately poised to deliver externalism rather than to say it's externalism, right? But I think the difference, and so there I think we have, we have a case where, um, you're right, we'd have to fill in the details about what the mark of the cognitive is, and then we'd have to check the world to see where, all the, where the functions are, are properly realised. That's right. Um, and, you know, we'd have to fight about what the right mark of the cognitive is. Something like Rupert's notion of kind of integrated mechanisms. Um, I actually am not, not convinced that the notion of integrated system will always favour internalism. I don't see the reason why there couldn't be extended systems that meet that constraint. Um, but we'd have to fight about different marks of the cognitive that are proposed by different people. Mm. The reason today I went into the non-derived content one was because that's the one that's used in this argument about what the strongest motivation internalists might have. So I think even on the internalist best story, we can get an extended cognition story on the basis of that. Nicole? Uh, yeah, Mark, I had, a, 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 I think, a minor uh, comment on one of your slides, the mm -hmm. one where um, Otto and Eric um, you, you quote them on um, uh, intrinsic or narrow content. Yep. If that you one. Can go oh, sorry. So. <laughs> <laughs> that one. No, that one. Sorry. Yeah, I'll find it. Don't worry. Go on. Yeah. So somewhere. I thought that you read them as saying that um, intrinsic content uh, entails internalism, and you took intrinsic Ooh, content to be basically original content, content that doesn't depend on other yeah. contents, basically. Okay. Uh, but I read them as referring to narrow content, which is content that two right. molecule by molecule identical right. individuals right. share, uh, regardless of the environment they're placed in. And it right. seems like if you admit that type of content, then uh, yeah, yeah, you quite internalism right. is favored. So yeah, I don't good. know. Yeah, good, but good, good, excellent. So that's exactly right. So I think how we read the or. Uh, oh, sorry, wrong. Well, that's, that's the Shemera one. Hang on, next one. Yeah. Next one. <clears throat> we, we'll need the quote, sorry to delay. There we go, right. So, how we read or here, narrow or intrinsic, of course, is quite, yeah. it's quite important. Um, I wasn't sure what to do with the or, right? Okay. So, you're right. The trouble is, if you picked narrow content, it would in favour, it would favour intelligence, but then it would look, it couldn't be a reasonable mark of the cognitive because it would beg the question. Yeah. Right? Okay, yeah. Whereas intrinsic content doesn't beg the question. So that's why you picked that. Yeah. Yeah. The, I, in fact, that was, that's, if, if narrow content's the only conceivable view, the game's over, right? In terms of it has to be true. But it looks like that's begging the question against the extremist. <clears throat> well, I mean, unless you admit that there's narrow content and also wide content, and then it seems like you could be, you could think, you right, could still okay. be open to... Okay, so I... You're right, actually, no, that's good. So, so, one could, so the move might, so here's the interesting thing, right, in a longer version of this, I start out with the idea that we should think about the claim as being that intrinsic, i.e. non-derived content, is, uh, is sufficient, as it were, and necessary, right? So, because then, then the idea would be that anything that's derived content couldn't possibly count, okay? Yeah. So that, but that's too strong a claim. As I said, after dealing with the other stuff, that's too strong a claim, it looks like, because it would rule out stuff that we would, we would normally take to be cognitive, even in terms of the, of the brain, right? So, so and even Adam Zizawa, you know, the stalwart architects of the internalist view here, would agree that it's only that some parts of the genuine cognitive state have to have non derived content. <laughs> now, you could play exactly the same move for narrow content if yeah. you can make it work, right? So, I, I t actually, you're right to probably point out that I could actually <coughs> run the same line about narrow content. Uh, possibly, yeah, that's yeah. right, that's interesting. I mean, I, as I say, I, I just, on my first reading, which I'd have to go back and think about now because I might have been wrong, I took that to beg the question against the externalist, so I just ignored it. Yeah. Um, and focused on the bit that I thought. Uh, it's clear that narrow and intrinsic aren't the same, right? So that all has to be read as a... Yeah, you can still just say, yeah, I admit narrow content, but then there's also white content, and that's yeah. a different story, yeah. and uh, yeah. it's external, you know, yeah. up it's a drop, yeah. Though you'd have to give, just as in the derived, non-derived case, you'd have to give an example yeah. of where you could see that it worked. Right? That's right. Yeah. Andy? <coughs> yeah, so actually just on that last point, in the <coughs> early presentation of the extended mind story, we pitched it as extended narrow content, actually. Yeah. Um, 
just because there was a thought you could still have even, even wider ways of doing the content assignment yeah, I remember and do that. stuff yeah. that's vehicled externally. Um, but, but related to that, the sort of issue that, that I wasn't quite sure about, at some point you seem to concede something like um, if it was externally vehicled, it couldn't have intrinsic content. You did concede that. Strategically, I'm prepared to commit but to that. But that's wrong to me because for the, yeah. for the same reason as you, you, you gave, that, as it were, the, the conditions on non derivedness or intrinsicness here are relatively weak. They're just mm. broadly speaking, teleosemantic. Yeah. If you have a lifetime version of something yeah. teleosemantic, you can have as much intrinsicness out there as you can in here. Yeah, no, that's right. What I was trying to do was, as it were, work with the case that's the best case for the internalist. Oh, I see. Okay. Right? So, because oh, you're right, right, if we can make sense of the notion of intrinsic content, that would apply just as well to external elements as it applied to brains, then you could just argue that there's intrinsic content in the, extended, in the external parts of the system that's spread out over brain, body and world. I was trying to allow the best case for the internalist, which was to allow the non-derived derived distinction and agree that all the non-derived content is in the brain. I think even in that really good case for the externalist, unless you go to the stronger claim that it's only non-derived content that counts as cognitive, which I don't think is defensible, then, then you can still defend the extended mind view on that. So that was the that was strategically, that's why I did it that way. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to bump just Eric ahead because you were attacking his view, so I thought quite right too. Were mm -hmm. to deal with I mean, not quite right, but I attacked him quite right, bumping. Yeah. Um, uh, and I'm going to give relatively short remarks. You talk way too, 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 uh, too fast, Michael. Yeah, it's a lot to get through. So many issues. Uh, just one of you, on your two teams, uh, the first one, the representation, uh, representation entails, or at least favors the vehicle internalism. Well, in, in, as in that generality, we don't get to us that claim. And we, we, yeah. We, we, yeah. But the point of that, the point was, you don't endorse it explicitly, but you're committed to it, I think, by the only reasonable reading of the text. So, you know. Okay, and the second remark on that is uh, um, the, the position you just described that you, uh, um, uh, you found indefensible, namely uh, the one in which um, uh, only, only the right content in the brain uh, is cognitive. That's a possibility for the for the uh, internalist, yeah. Um, for the right. Anti, and, 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 and merely the existence right. of that possibility uh, can be seen as a weakness. Right. So let's put it this way: it couldn't be precisely what you just said. It couldn't. We know. We know the externalist doesn't even have to engage with the with the bold claim that there's um, there's only undivided content in brains. Right. It has to be that non-derived content is the mark of the cognitive. And then when we look, we find out that otherwise that would be begging the question again, right? So it has to start from this idea that non-derived content is a good theory of the cognitive. And then you look to see where it falls, right? Now, the, the, so the argument against the thought that, and this is the bit where I said, look, there's one claim which would be that non-derived content is sort of strictly necessary. And that means, that I'm interpreting that as meaning that the only cognitive, the, the only thing that can have cognitive cognition, if you like, is non-derived content, because it's a very non-derived content. They're the only ones that are going to count as cognitive. And you're right that if, it, if you took that view, and you also made the concession review that Andy and I were just talking about, which is you agree that all the non-derived content would be in brains, then you would end up with an internalism. Okay? But, but the reason the extended functions doesn't have to make that concession is partly, of course, because the internalists themselves don't, don't hold that. That was the point of the quotation of Adam Zizar. Adams and Isaiah themselves are explicit that non-derived content only has to be part of a system where there's other parts of the system that doesn't have non-derived content, and presumably therefore can have derived content. So partly it's a dialectical point that the, 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 you know, the most rabid internalists <coughs> already agree that that's too strict a condition. And the other reason for thinking it is too strict a condition, not merely the, as it were, playing on the same ballpark as the internalists, is the kind of case that that, uh, that Andy has talked about, um, I mean, that's an imaginary case, you know, the Marshall bitmap system, where it looks like we have, a, we have a, a wholly internal system that bears, that we're completely happy to count as cognitive, but bears both non-derived and derived content. So if, the inter if that's a perfectly reasonable count on the internalist story about what, the, what counts as a cognitive system, then there seems no reason to rule out an extended story that has exactly the same mixed representationality, right? Um, Purely because it's got some extended bits. Uh, that would be begging the question again. Well, one, one short follow up, and then I'll go to my second. Well, 
it's unnecessary to, 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 to consider the internal system as covered. And we might disagree on that. So, so, right, so it's, again, so, uh, uh, of course you don't accept that there's any content there at all, right? Right, so, I mean, that's fine, yeah, but that's the point of the second part of the argument, right? Yeah. Um, so your view, but the, the, the thought here is supposed to be that officially what you and uh, uh, Dan hold is that there's a stalemate between the internalist and the extended mind theorist, right? And that's to be traced to a joint commitment to content. And what I'm suggesting is by your own reasoning, it looks like the, 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 the stalemate breaks in the internalist's favour, and then my thought was actually in reality it doesn't, it breaks in the extended functionist's favour. And thus, that part of the argument doesn't deliver the inference from representationalism, even non-derived representation, to internalism. That's only part of an argument. That's why you need the second part, which is to show that if you give up on content, you don't necessarily get ex external. Now, of course, you could accept that, right? Of course, you could accept that. Um, but I, I, I think that the, what the affordance case does, because it's the, one of the examples that you like and you choose, mm -hmm. it shows that there's a kind of still some work to be done. Yeah. yeah, but yeah, regarding that second part, mm -hmm. uh, you said you, you, you said one can still in the foreign space and the topology, one could still one could still explain uh, that or or explain it saying that all the cognitive elements <coughs> are internal. Yeah, you point out a possibility. Yeah, one can think about it in terms of internal doing all the cognitive work. <coughs> Of course, one can think about that, but one should have to motivate. Right, so there I take it, that's where I, a couple of times I mentioned this thought that um, as I see the shape of the debate, right, there's a couple of things that need to be said. The first is that given that internalism is one of the commitments of orthodox cognitive science, we, I think all of us who are externalists have to start from the thought that the internalist gets to win unless we can budge them. Right? I just, I, you know, that seems to be just a basic fact about the way we do philosophy of science. Right? We say we only have revolutionary transformations you know, when the existing theory not only runs into trouble, but where there's an alternative that can, that, as it were, can do, the, do better work. And I, it strikes me that, and, I mean, just saying well, we should start from, the, from an extensive position where, we, where internalism it doesn't get to be the default, you've got, given that dialectic where we take the internalist to have the kind of default position, you have to motivate getting, starting from that extended position. Now, there's ways you could do that, right? Which, which I didn't talk about today. Maybe you say, we do loads of great science that starts from that position, and it solves various problems. That the, 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 the position that starts from a, an internal mind, and then that gets spread out under certain circumstances, that they can't solve, right? You could, could do that, right? But that, I mean, I'll take it that's in a whole other set of arguments, right? But that's the way I think it happen. Okay. Okay, uh, just two more short questions. There was a question from the middle, in the middle of the room, yeah? Oh, yeah. Thank you very much for the topic. It reminded me of how people learn in a complex task. So, for example, the study by Wayne Gray, where he studied how people learn to play, obtain expertise in Tetris. So, the novice yeah. players prefer to rotate tokens physically, mm. but when they get an expertise, they rotate the tokens mentally. Mm. So, so I just missed the last because the door opened, okay. sorry, I couldn't hear So the study by Wayne Gray where he studies how people gain expertise in playing Tetris. So these yeah. players prefer to rotate tokens physically, but the expert players prefer to rotate tokens mentally. Yeah. And that action is much more efficient once they learn it. And it seems, is it possible to interpret that action as a, like a vehicle internal externalism leads to a more advanced version of vehicle internalism? Right, well, I, I think what's really important, right, I mean, there's a, there's a, there's a story which goes like this, right, that, um, I mean, development psychologists, I think, have had this in the picture ever since Vygotsky, right, it's this idea that, you know, we, we engage with lots of external structures, and then there's a further phase of internalisation, whereas it were, we, 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 we take on those structures internally. Now that's scaffolding, that's a kind of scaffolding story, right? You get to have the complex cognitive stuff or the more efficient or better behaviour, doing, you know, as it were, mental rotation or whatever, by doing the stuff with the, on the screen first. And I think that's a, an important phenomenon that we all need to understand, right? All, the only thing I'd say from now is that it looks like that story is consistent with both the embedded and the extended view. Right? So you might think that the way I get to do better Tetris is by moving the stuff around on the screen, and then I go through an internalisation phase where I can do it in the head, and then I might use that as an even more efficient strategy. And that looks like that's consistent with the idea that all those external movements were, were not really cognitive. They were just supports or scaffolds for that later internal behaviour, to internal capacity to come on board. 
So we'd need extra arguments to shift it from an embedded to an extended view. And I also think really fascinating is the question of how the extended theorist handles internalization, right? What the extended theorist says about internalization. Um, a few years ago, Andy and I had a debate in, the, in, a, in a linguistics journal about this kind of issue. And so one view would be that you just use exactly the same mechanisms you use when the Tetris blocks are on the screen, but you kind of internally train those mechanisms on imagined Tetris blocks. So there's no real change in the mechanisms. But there's a change in the kind of location of the, the, the content bearing vehicles to which they're targeted, perhaps, way to describe it. Um, on another view, actually, to do internalization, there's a lot of extra structure that the, common, the internal common system will need. And we, so internalization requires a change to the structures. And I think that's a debate. You know, well, Andy thinks he won, and I thought I won, and that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Just a quick question, Karina. Yeah, actually, just is that a good good point. Point. Um, I agree with everything, but I made a similar argument in a paper I published a few years ago um, for, the, for against Adam and Ayala's uh, claim for non-derived content against externalism. Um, but just to strengthen your case, I think even if non-derived content is only in brains and it's strictly necessary for cognition, I think the externalist still has the case that we have social cognitive extension, because then we still have non-derived content in brains only. And so that the internalist might still have to embrace the case of the possibility that there's yeah. social cognitive extension. So is the idea this? So, um, so we agree that the, the symbols on the page are derived representations. So the internalist who makes non-derived content strictly necessary cognition gets to win, right? However, you point out, imagine situations in which there's a cognitive process that's spread over lots of different people. And then you think all the content that's going on in those different brains is all non-derived. Is that the idea? Yeah, something like that. Right. Right. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I mean, I have general worries about social extension, which would take a lot of to sort of sketch. But I think you're right that that would be a that would be a case where if, if that go if social extension works as a phenomenon, there really are things like Hutchins processes of yeah. you know ship navigation spread over lots of people. If you could argue that, as it were. What you've got there is one cognitive system that's spread over lots of different individuals, all of which have non-derived content, or even two, yeah. yeah. Then, you, then you get a case of extended mind. You're right about the principle, but we'd we'll have to think about it in detail, yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I, yeah, let's thank you.